outcomes of a study I've been working on in the UK called Practical Routes for the Integration of PV. So let me just talk a little bit about what the problem is I'm trying to solve. As things have evolved a bit since I started doing this study. Ah, there we go. OK, so I'm just going to stand over this side. Oh. Can I take the microphone? Yeah. Cool. So the real problem we've got here is that feed-in tariffs in the UK have historically kind of been kind of required to ensure that there's an uptake of the, uh, of the technology on the system. And it's been able to facilitate the introduction of 2.5 gigawatts of rooftop solar PV, and in total about 13 gigawatts of PV on the system. So unfortunately, the feed-in tariff was removed as of March this year. It started at about 50p a kilowatt hour in 2010. It dropped down to about 5p in 2016, and now it's nothing. Unfortunately, that's caused the integration of PV on the system to just slow down to absolutely zero. So the government originally wanted to get to about 20, 22 gigawatts of installation on the system. And to do that, we're going to have to find a way to practically integrate it, more PV on the system with other subsidies and other, and, and other routes to market, or other ways to make money. Um, on top of this issue we have an issue with distribution constraints. There's an awful lot of talk about what happens if we put PV on the system, what happens then when it causes voltage constraints or ampacity constraints on networks, which ultimately mean that we have to reconduct or add batteries or curtail the system, which makes it less environmentally friendly or economically friendly than it was just to not have it in the first place. But no one really knows whether that's true or not. And the same is true for transmission. Now, the aims of this study have changed a little bit, so what I'm really trying to do is to consider whether the cost of further rooftop PV integration um, can be mapped out or not, because they're not mapped out, and we really don't know anything about this at the moment. So first thing I'm going to talk to you about is what feed-in tariff is really required to influence further uptake in the UK. Um, we're going to then consider what happens if we try some alternative marketing schemes for PV on the rooftops. What if we try peer-to-peer -peer trading, which is uh, up and coming in the UK at the moment? What if we try um, synthetic PPA agreements? Um, and how much would that actually cost the government if we were to take this to the extreme and say all of the rooftop PV we put on in the system is going to be paid for by the government, our subsidy is going to be paid to help integrate it, and all of it's going to be rooftop, there's not going to be any more huge megawatt hour size farms, what are we going to do? Um, economically, what are the costs of local constraint management in terms of distribution networks, and environmentally, what are the costs of the same? Um, one thing I probably must state is that I'm only about two-thirds of the way through this study, so I am planning to do some transmission network stuff. I haven't done that yet, so hopefully in the next few months I'll be able to present somewhere the outcomes of that study. So the revenue streams we're going to consider, as I said before, for the reduction of feed-in tariff requirements from the government are peer-to-peer trading in synthetic PPA and also a bit of battery energy storage. So in peer-to-peer -peer trading, say you're all my peers and I own the generation technology, I can say to you, OK, if I'm exporting energy, you can buy that from me for a certain price that's probably a little bit below the grid retail price to you. So if it's 14 pence per kilowatt hour, you might be paying 11 or 12 pence per kilowatt hour. It's cheaper for you because you don't have to buy it from a supplier. It's a advantage for me because I'm not exporting and not getting paid for it at all. Now, in a synthetic PPA agreement, what happens is if I'm a generator and you're an off-taker, is we say, OK, this is, we've got a strike price. That strike price is £40 per megawatt hour. My, I, I, I'm going to sell my energy to the grid um, in the middle of the day when there's a lot of solar generation for maybe £35 per kilowatt hour, and you're going to buy it for that cost, buying and selling at the same price in the UK. Um, market. Um, what you then have to do is pay me five pounds, so I'm getting 40 pounds per megawatt, per megawatt hour, and you're paying 40 pounds per megawatt hour. Conversely, if I sell at 45 pounds per megawatt hour, I pay you, so I'm only getting 40 pounds for my generation. Uh, you're only paying 40, and it's effectively a hedging technique for the off-taker, and it's, a, um, it's just a security of revenue stream technique for the seller. 
Um, also going to consider what happens if we use a small battery on site behind the meter. So that can be used to increase self-consumption. So we charge when there's excess generation. Use that to avoid grid import. Um, so let's just a little bit now on how we're actually going to calculate the feed-in tariff. So we're going to do this with net present value calculations that are run for 25 years, which is the predicted lifetime of the system. We use a discount rate of 7.5%, um, and we estimate the cost as follows. So we have a cost of a PV array. That's in the first year. We assume that's paid up front at a cost this year of 65, uh, 6,500. If we do anything for future years, that drops in line with the EU projections. We've got balance of system costs, which is integrated into the cost in the first year, and then an inverter cost in the 12th and 13th years. And then we have um, any taxes on non-feed-in tariff income. So we expect that peer-to-peer -peer trading and PPA would be taxable income. Profit-wise, peer-to-peer um, -peer and PPA, as I've just suggested there, we assume we just selling our energy to our peers for three pence less than the market price. PPA-wise, we're assuming about three and a half pence per kilowatt hour, which is in line with current EU synthetic PPAs. Um, we, use, we, we calculate how much revenue there could potentially be or how much yield there is for peer-to-peer -to -peer trading, PPAs and self-consumption from time series analysis. So that's really laying a demand time series, a generation time series on top of one, one another. If there's any excess in generation, that's exported and could be peer PPA. If there's exported generation, but that also overlaps with a peer's demand, then that could be peer-to-peer -peer income. Um, we include a 3.5 kilowatt hour battery system, which is in line with Mike's style size systems that are currently being rolled out in the UK at the moment. Um, and we've written an algorithm that tries to maximize self-consumption and peer-to-peer -peer trading, which I don't really have enough time to go through here, so I won't do that. We examine three retail electricity price increase per year scenario. So if the retail electricity price goes up, then the value um, of electricity to the customer increases, and so does the value of peer-to-peer -peer trade, and so that could determine how profitable ownership of a system is. Um, we use the 7.5% discount rate because uh, what, what we then do is we run the net present value calculation and iteratively increase the value of the government subsidy until we increase zero on that MPV calculation, which suggests we're getting a, re um, a return of 7.5% a year once we get above zero with that discount rate. So once we've simulated all of these different situations, what we see is quite interesting in that although peer-to-peer -peer is quite effective, it nowhere near removes the need for a government subsidy. So rooftop PV is nowhere near the point at which it can survive without a subsidy, as the government is suggesting at the moment. Although, if we look at the most likely case, the um, retail electricity price increase of 1.1% per year, it actually halves from about, about 13 pence to about, about 7.5 pence per kilowatt hour, about halves the uh, requirement for a government subsidy there. And that's this year. If we were to put this in place this year, we'll talk about what would happen if we were to put this into place in the next few years on the next slide. Um, another interesting point here is that battery energy storage systems significantly increase the required feed-in tariff. So you might expect that the increased potential for peer-to-peer -peer trading and self-consumption would make it a little cheaper. However, it costs an awful lot of money to integrate these lithium-ion storage systems behind the meter. So ultimately, it costs a lot more to run, and it's not really economically feasible. So... One thing we thought was, well, let's run with the peer-to-peer -peer thing. Let's see when this becomes economically feasible and see how much it would cost in an extreme case in which we assume that all of the extra 10 gigawatts of PV is installed onto the network in, in the next 20 years, and it's all rooftop. So how much would that actually cost? Well, it seems that the peak cost would be around 150 million pounds, about 163 million pounds, year. It increases rapidly as more and more people are uptaking the technology and getting the subsidy. And then it drops off gradually, and then it falls off a cliff at 20 years when the subsidy's up and we're not paying anymore. Um, so one thing we noticed was that in the 1.1% retail electricity price scenario is that 
by year nine, the requirement for a subsidy drops to zero. So if we were to wait nine years and then just roll out peer-to-peer -peer trading and never offer a subsidy, so by 2038, we could potentially integrate as much rooftop PV onto the network as we wanted to without having to worry about people taking it up because they'd be getting that 7.5% return on investment rate that would be required. So how large a cost is £160 million per year to the UK? Well, it turns out actually not so much. Uh, it's about 0.02% of government spending. Government spending this year is set to look somewhere around 820, 830 billion pounds. Um, it's also, if you look at it in terms of other gov government schemes at the moment, the, there's a fuel duty freeze that has been active for the last 10 years or so. And it's thought that the, the cost of not tapping into that revenue by the government is effectively costing the government £9 billion a year. Now, it's controversial to call this a cost because is an untapped revenue a cost. I don't really know, and people might debate that. It's also a little controversial in the sense that... Um, it, fuel duty is enormous in the UK, so that's a bit of an issue. If you were to increase it, it might be met with quite a big political backlash. But even so, it just goes to show that just one energy, bit, one bit of energy policy is costing the government... Oh, oh, how far off the end am I now? The duty is the tax, isn't it? It is, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought you were telling me I uh, didn't have much time left. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. So that's the tax, yeah. Um, so if you were to remove this... You could pay for this maybe 50 times over. So it just goes to show the power of one policy. You know, the cost of one policy is nothing compared to what it would cost to get a bit of PV on the network. So, as I mentioned earlier, if we try to increase the amount of PV on a low voltage network in the UK, these networks are much more sprawling than they are over here. So these can be 500 meters a kilometer, a kilometer and a half long. Um, when you're trying to push a lot of current down one of those, the impedance means it has to be facilitated by quite a high voltage rise. Um, if you're pushing enough down it, you will exceed the upper limit allowed on a UK low voltage network, and that's 253 volts. So we can see here for a, um, this is for a network with 75 loads on it. It has, um, it's about 700 meters, 600 meters long. Uh, it's got three phases. It's got a penetration of about 25, 60% uh, per phase, sorry, 50, 50% per phase. Um, we're already exceeding that limit. I haven't put the numbers on the side, but the third phase there, it's hitting about 258, 259 volts. Um, so how can we stop this sort of thing from happening? Well, we can reconduct the network with thicker cables with much, much higher impedances. Uh, much, much lower impedances, sorry. Or we could curtail that energy so we're actively preventing that current ever being pushed onto the network so it can't do anything. One thing we could use is battery energy storage, but I've done an awful lot of work into that in the last few years, and it would cost for a network like this with only 75 loads on it, I expect about a quarter of a million pounds. Uh, it's just not economically feasible, so we're not going to look at that. So we've done a little bit of work looking at reconductoring and how much it would cost to apply this to 29. Right, okay. Okay, I'm going to skip this. We don't need to know too much about that. So what we find is reconductoring is by far the cheapest way to do this. It's about half the price of curtailment. That's because if we curtail energy, we lose about 400 kilowatt hours of potential peer-to-peer -peer trading. Um, if we install re if we cons if we install cabling, it doesn't really make that much of a cost difference. We might only need to reconduct a. 80 meters of a network for a 40% PV penetration. That's not really too much of a problem. We can do that. It's not that expensive, about 8,000 pounds. So you can see how this can be a lot cheaper. Uh, we think that it will cost about, for the entire UK networks, in the worst case scenario, for a 40% penetration on a quarter of all networks for 10 gigawatts peak on the network, about, about 500 million pounds to do that. And that's a worst case scenario, in which case the DNO aren't reconducting themselves. Um, do I need to stop there? I've got the odd extra slide. The last slide, right.
let's just talk about this. So I did a little bit of work on how can we avoid, uh, what's, the, what's the environmental cost of reconductor in networks? What's the environmental cost of um, putting batteries on networks to actively control current inject to prevent voltage rise and ampacity constraints? So I looked at avoiding PV installation altogether, and then I looked at using American-made and Chinese-made batteries and reconducting the network, architailing energy. It turns out that although many argue that you could completely wipe out any economic and environmental benefit by doing this kind of thing to get PV onto the network, it's actually, um, actually not that big a problem. In fact, the worst thing you can do is use Chinese-made battery energy storage systems of 13 kilowatt hours and a five kilowatt hour peak output. And that's only about a tenth as bad as completely inviting one PV installation. And you could reconduct to hundreds of networks and it wouldn't even dent the cost of one PV installation in an economic, in an environmental sense, in a CO2 sense. So I would have concluded there, but it looks like I've overrun a little bit. Sorry about that. So <laughs> if anybody has any questions and we've got time for that, please feel free to ask. Nuclear is a good choice if you can get that onto the network quickly. Um, we've got Hinkley Power Station in the um, pipeline at the moment. But it's, oh, it's a nightmare. Yeah, it's an absolute nightmare. So yes, I agree that PV could be quite, uh, sorry, not PV, but it could be quite useful. I agree nuclear could be an answer to this. However, it's just an organizational nightmare. It doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Um, as we say, we've only really got 30 years to sort this out, and you could give it nine years, wait, like I said, give it nine years, wait until PV is doable without a subsidy on the rooftop, and just let things run. So um, that's always an option. We probably won't even have it.